We are Pro Cannabis Media. If you had to pick one person who was most responsible for legalizing cannabis in Massachusetts, Dr. Keith Saunders is the man. This sociologist from Northeastern University is a past five-term president of MassCan, New England's largest normal chapter. Recently, he was a featured speaker at CWCB Expo in Boston. Now, he's on In the Weeds with Jimmy Young. Don't look now, but it's a whole new world of weed out there. Pot is flower, it's Bruce Banner and Blue Dream. You've got bongs and dabs, resin and shatter, vaping and edibles, new terms, new strains, and new ways to use cannabis sativa, the plant. Some just made with CBD, and hemp has minimal THC. There's sativa and indica strains, and 100 chemicals, all legal in 10 states for adult use. There's a lot to get to know. Get used to it, folks, because it's legal in the Bay State and it's not going away. Neither is In the Weeds with Jimmy Young next. Revolutionary Clinics is just one of 49 medical cannabis dispensaries in Massachusetts, but there's a reason why it's one of the most popular. It's their patient-first philosophy. All day long, they teach, they educate, they communicate about this complicated plant called cannabis sativa. That's true. Whether you visit their Cambridge location in Fresh Pond at 110 Fawcett Street or at 67 Broadway in Somerville. Revolutionary Clinics, where the patient comes first. Hi, everybody. Welcome again to a very special edition on location of In the Weeds with Jimmy Young here at the Heinz Auditorium in Boston, Massachusetts for the CWCB Expo. That's right. And uh, joining me is Keith Saunders, who is on the board of directors of Normal, the national organization for the reform of marijuana laws. Congratulations, first of all, Keith, because I know this was a goal to get adult use recreational passed in in Massachusetts, and you did it in my home state, so I really appreciate that. Well, it was my home state as well, and it's it's definitely been a labor of love. And now it's here. You guys won the war, if you will, but now the rules and the regulations are out there. Do you focus more on, what are you focusing on now? Right now in legal states, normal is shifting its focus from what it was known for, which was legalize it, Um, to consumer protection, which is what Norman was originally organized around. It's just that the greatest risk to consumers was arrest and conviction. And so when that goes away, now it becomes consumer safety, product consistency, access, tax rates, and so forth. Well, I'm sure you know the illicit market has reared its ugly head. It's so funny. For years, the illicit market is all we had if we enjoyed cannabis. And now um, that regulations are here and rules and testing, I know where my stuff is coming from. I know what it's going to be doing to me. And I can pick and choose and almost compound the type of weed I'd like to be using. Um, Therein lies a challenge, though. Do you believe it is the regulations that have fueled the illicit market? Well, uh, yes, they have. Well, prohibition as a regulation birthed the illicit market. Uh, The problem that we're having is we, in our attempt to legalize medicinally and in in terms of adult use, um, instead of going to where the marijuana users are, which they already existed among us, instead of going to where the suppliers are who were fulfilling all of the demand that the market had, they decided to create artificial markets. So Massachusetts actually has three different cannabis markets. The most difficult one to get into is the medicinal market, both in terms of starting out with vertical integration and disqualifying as a patient. Second most difficult is to get into the retail, the adult retail market, um, with its taxation, with its um, you know limited licensure and so forth, and, you know not easy access. And then there's the traditional organic market, which is sub- still supplying the majority of users, including the heaviest users. And so since one of the goals for question four was to reduce the draw of the unregulated market, um, creating an artificial market on top of it is actually not doing much to to change that. Um, It would work better, I think, if they went to the people who are already consuming most heavily and already selling and distributing and let them have some form of licensure, require that their product be batch tested, require that it be child-resistant packaged, and require that they pay a tax bond. 
And so it, you just run it through that so that, that a, you don't put the sticker shock upon the people who buy the most cannabis and consume the most cannabis. Because in my entire life, I've purchased one half gram of concentrate here in Massachusetts and paid $7 in tax. And I decided that I'm not going to, it just doesn't make any sense because I can get it for so much less. Um, so, and plus you can grow your own now. And, and that's interesting. You know, again, let's talk about the growing your own as part of the law here because it's, it's six plants per adult per dwelling times two. So basically if you have a husband and wife or a mother and father and they uh, want to grow cannabis, you can get 12 plants growing on your property. And that can be either indoor or outdoor, correct? Yes. Depending on your neighbors, I suppose. That being said, doesn't a crop of 12 plants transform into, a grower told me this, like three and a half pounds? If people know what they're doing and <laughs> invest enough resource into right. it. Outdoors, it would be easier to produce three and a half pounds or even three pounds out of 12 plants, which is four ounces per plant. That's not a, not a huge yield. Uh, indoors, however, you're going to need the entire setup. This is not somebody who's got themselves a, a little grow light from Home Depot and, and a couple of four-inch pots because they're not going to produce that much. So it takes skill. It takes practice. Um, in my own experience cultivating, uh, it, you can mess things up pretty easily, uh, especially if you're using stuff other than soil as your medium because it very rapidly the plant will absorb whatever's coming through the, the water, and uh, you can get burns and, and so forth. So. Having 12 plants will produce a good amount, but it doesn't produce an unlimited amount. Right, but my, I guess my, where I was going with this is here's, you can grow this stuff legally on your property, but I don't know about you, but I don't think I've ever consumed that much weed in one year. Uh, you know, it's a lot, right? Mm -hmm. So doesn't that, you can gift it, yep. right? And I do, I do like to gift. Um, th that being said, uh, was it, do you look, as you look back, was it a positive or negative about allowing amateurs to grow cannabis in their backyard? Oh, it's definitely a positive. Especially when you look at some of the other states' rules, they don't allow growing, in fact, other countries' rules, mm -hmm. right? So growing it was probably one of the first things you guys wanted to make sure you got on that uh, question four? It was something that was in the, yes, it was definitely something that was the idea being that we can go after the underground market most effectively if we allow people to produce their own supply. Right. Um, so that was really the strategy behind it. But aren't they the underground market now that you've given them that opportunity? If they're not selling it for money, no. <laughs> right. If they're gifting it to the world, it is a gift, isn't it? And there's, th there's also the question of potency. Just because you grow a large volume doesn't mean that you're growing a very potent cannabis. And then further, the volume of cannabis necessary to make edibles or extractions and so forth is, is larger than if you're just smoking it. So there's a couple of other things we can talk about uh, with that law. One, and I give the Massachusetts credit for making sure that those who were most affected by the war on drugs get a shot at this industry. And you know what's happened. It's been difficult for them to do that. Are you seeing an effort now to give those an opportunity? Well, the new laws, uh, the new regulations regarding delivery and social consumption are to be uh, held out for uh, social equity and economic empl empowerment applicants. The city of uh, Cambridge has given economic empowerment applicants a two-year window of exclusivity. They're now being sued by the existing medical dispensaries. Oops. <laughs> This is the politics of cannabis business now. This but it's the law, too, and th I really do believe that the City Council of Cambridge is breaking the law by doing this. Possibly, although they're not shutting down the business and they're not saying that they can't sell cannabis. They're saying that you can't go into this particular market until there are established economic empowerment, in part because without uh, giving economic empowerment the opportunity to succeed, it'll fail off the bat. And I, look, I certainly know the Rev Clinics people, and I believe that the compromise that they pr proposed that was a $5 million pool of money to help train those people really made a lot of sense to me as someone who's just an observer. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, where do you think this is going to end up? Uh, the economic empowerment. Well, what's going to happen in the city of Cambridge? Are they going to win the suit? Are they going to lose the suit? Are they going to come to an agreement? I mean, usually with lawsuits, very rarely do they go to court. They, mm -hmm. The lawyers end up being the, 
the real champions in this, and they cut a deal. And it depends on what the city of Cambridge is willing to do in terms of their expense. And obviously, the dispensaries have millions of dollars at their disposal, and since Cambridge has a limited budget. Um, however, uh, that's not the only source of pressure. And that Cambridge being as it is, the people there might do something along the lines of boycott those operations that they feel are treating the economic empowerment people unfairly. Um, and yet they didn't want to. You know they didn't want to. They just worked. I mean, it was a fact of the way business is done. Uh, they didn't. Who didn't want to do? I, I think the 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 Revolutionary Clinic group wanted to help those who had been most impacted on the war on drugs by offering them training. Doesn't that make sense? Well, yes and no. It depends upon what they're being trained as. Um, and you know, the idea being with the social equity program, which is for people who have been disproportionately affected, when $5 million from Canada comes into and opens up a, a store in your town and they say we're going to hire 50% of our uh, employees will be coming from this economic empowerment or social equity area, and then they look out there and it, what jobs are available. So uh, social equity itself is not going to turn people into accountants and attorneys and give them MBAs. Mm -hmm. So the, the best paying, best compensated professional jobs will still be held by people who have far more resources and these new employees are going to come in as bud tenders and as trimmers and as uh, manufacturers and, and uh, you know f edible makers and so forth. So um, that particular of social inequality is not going to be remedied simply by legalizing marijuana and saying these people get priority in terms of hiring. Um, so that will not that's not going to change. Um, the struggle right now is a matter of scale. And because in part of it's the regulation, because the Cannabis Control Commission set the regulations as they did, if you don't have seven figures, you are not able to enter. And so, you know, I mean, if you look at it in terms of pizza, something as simple as pizza, every town in Massachusetts has a town pizza. It's family-owned business, costs maybe fifty to eighty thousand dollars to start. You buy a couple ovens, a low boy, you employ your family members and the kids' friends from school, and you make a living. Then there's the Bertucci's model, which is you buy a plot of land, you architecturally design it, you buy the you franchise, you do everything necessary, and you sell Bertucci's brand pizza and you know to a certain volume of traffic, and you'll be making money as a franchise owner. And then there's Pizza Hut, which is you own all of Pizza Hut. The co corporation that owns Pizza Hut makes pizza too and sells it and makes a profit. We're somewhere at the Bertucci's level with a lot of this Pizza Hut about to come in uh, especially as these Canadian and other companies grow. Tilray, uh, th when they capitalize, I mean, they're losing a whole bunch of money, but th you know what? Lyft loses money. Google loses money. Uh, this is the new economy. <laughs> they can afford to lose money. That's what they say about the investment world, too. Don't invest unless you know you can lose what you invest. Mm -hmm. And this is what they're going through now. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so let, let's talk. We'll talk a little bit about social equity and economic empowerment. I do, but I want to I get a state in your eyes and your mm -hmm. view, we're about a year in. November 20th, I believe, was the date uh, last year that adult use opened and Stephen Mandeli was at Cultivate when I was there too. It was a historical moment. I felt like I had to be there, yep. and I was. Um, w over 320 million odd has been sold in the adult use market so far. What's your view of this first year of this in this state? Uh, shortage of supply, excessive weights, uh, taxation is too high, but not it, we're gonna, that revenue is going to end up rising and then falling. As we open more retail stores, you'll see it rise, and then as the price declines, you'll see it fall. Um, it's, it'll, it'll be greater than we're, we're collecting right now, no doubt whatsoever. As uh, Connecticut, New York, and Vermont open up commercial retail uh, sales, we'll see revenues drop in the western part of the state. That's one of the reasons the western part of the state is driven so strongly is because of its proximity to the three different states that you can't buy at retail from. I know a lot of New Yorkers come over. I think, I think I saw something like 80 percent of the revenue brought in by the Berkshire cannabis owners is from New York. I actually have worked with a few of them. I've been out there on the regular. When I go to Great Barrington and I go to Theory Wellness, none of the cars in the lot has a Massachusetts plate. They're all out of state plates. But of course, they can't go across state lines with that <laughs> stuff now, can they, Nobody Keith? Nobody ever does that. I, <laughs> you know, we sit here and we giggle about that because we remember when we were always looking over our shoulders for the law enforcement. Now the law enforcement is on the side of the regulators and the licensees. Mm -hmm. 
it's a complete turnaround, and now the licensees and the, the regulators, they want to go after that illicit market. It, that's what's happened in California as well, where you have uh, licensed operators who are calling in or dropping dimes on outdoor cultivators who are not licensed and saying, fly over and raid, fly over and raid. Uh, Massachusetts doesn't have the large-scale outdoor cultivation, underground outdoor cultivation California has, so it's not quite as direct. But without a doubt, um, dispensaries and, and retail stores do not like the competition because they can't, they can't really compete with it. You've been to California, right? Yes. It's really another planet to, from the Northeast, isn't it? Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. But is it dangerous or is it good faith to look at their mature market as an example of what not to do or to do? Well, I, regulate, cannabis users have never been affected very much by regulation. That is, you can, may, you can prohibit it and threaten to throw them in jail and they'll still use it. Um, you know, so we develop all sorts of strategies to accommodate this inconvenience that's prohibition. Mm -hmm. And now when you get rid of prohibition, those strategies can sort of fall by the wayside. Um, but still, now the competition is coming from legitimate licensed operators. So, yeah, in a way, it's a deal with the devil. You, g you trade uh, lots and lots of arrests for fewer arrests um, and higher prices. Um, as you, I'm sure, know, um, education is the key to this. Not just educating those who want to get into the industry, but those who are looking outside the industry in. One of my biggest frustrations with my former comrades in the med media world in Boston is there's no public service announcements that are positive about cannabis. Um, you knew Acreage Holdings tried to air a PSA on the Super Bowl this past mm -hmm. year. Um, that, with three extremely compelling stories, mm -hmm. that, by the way, we had on our homepage uh, for as long as we possibly could, which was great. But those are the stories that aren't being told. Mm -hmm. How frustrating is that? Well, that's the condition of prohibition. Prohibition relies on censorship. You have to teach people that the thing that you are prohibiting exists, but you have to teach them that there's nothing positive about it, which, of course, doesn't it flies in the face of... of common sense that anything you know things have negatives and positives I mean for as bad as tobacco is it does have a social value um, that's why people continue to use it it's not that you know everybody's hopelessly addicted it's that they find that there's a social value in tobacco consumption and so they choose to do to choose to use it I think there's uh, a little bit of uh, about alcohol too a lot of that's kind of part of our society and people always forget that right yes yeah. It, is it th when people come up to you and you know they they say you know I'm just not into that cannabis thing I don't think it should be legal how do you how do you counter the most basic argument? Well, if you think prohibition's working, that makes sense. But if prohibition's causing harm, it might be better for us to treat it rather than as a criminal justice problem than as a public health problem. Because again, going back to tobacco, we never prohibited tobacco. We never arrested anybody for tobacco production, consumption, sales. Yet we managed to reduce daily tobacco use in the United States from over 60% in the late 1960s to about 20% today. So we saw a huge reduction in this marketplace. How did we do it? Taxation, public education based on facts, and um, reining in, in so many ways, tobacco companies by not allowing them to you know, sell to minors, to advertise to minors, to you know, that type of stuff. Two studies, recent studies in both Colorado and Washington State have actually shown that cannabis use has gone down in the states that are illegal amongst teenagers. Did that lead the news in the Massachusetts market or did the fact that somebody forgot to tell the city of Cambridge that they, didn't, they changed ownership, that led the news mm -hmm. in media? Um, as you know, media tends to look for the most sensational story to report on negatives are more sensational than positives. How are we ever going to change that? Uh, we don't really have to. It's just a matter of sort of changing the discourse on cannabis. It's where, what is your rubric? Um, so we have a rubric in our culture that uh, sick people should do everything they can to get well. Uh, we also have a general sense that using drugs for pleasure is wrong. So you can tell people don't use drugs, but you can't tell a sick person don't use medicine. And so once we started to refer to cannabis as medicine, we change the entire discourse and change the entire dialogue. Now we have an ensconced medicinal cannabis, tons of support all across the country. Laws in 46 states allow for some form of medicinal use, which is all violation of federal law, every bit of it. Um, so we have the situation, um, but it's such that the medical side has now been built up as a market 
that when legalization comes along, oftentimes patients or those involved in the medical side don't want legalization in the way that legalization works. Um, so, so that's why I say we have three different cannabis markets in Massachusetts, and they don't all have the same players, and they don't all have the same interests. Um, but as regarding um, cannabis use by teens in legal states, uh, I think that's more of a generational uh, effect than it is a, an effect of the law. Cannabis laws don't affect use rates directly. They're always an indirect effect. The, the model that seems to work best since World War II is when we have large proportions of the population between 15 and 25 years of age, we see cannabis use go up. As that cohort shrinks, cannabis use goes down. So we saw a rise in the 60s and the 70s with the baby boom. It declines through the 80s into the early 90s with Generation X, a smaller generation. And then in the mid-90s, it starts to go up again until about eight years ago. Uh, it was on this slow, steady rise. Um, and part of that is because of millennials. Well, the millennials started to age past their 20s as we get into the, 19 uh, the 2010s, and we start to see these use rates steady and, and perhaps decline. Now, now that we have medicinal and, and recreational, that model might not apply I anymore whatsoever. But during prohibition, your ability to obtain a supply was essential. And your ability to obtain a supply of illegal cannabis based upon was based upon your cohort network. Did you have a dense one that had lots of sources, or do you have a looser one that doesn't have the necessary connections? Massachusetts, we're right in the middle of this uh, four-month ban that the governor put in about vaping. It, you know, we still are waiting for the Department of Health to actually. Uh, okay. I'm fearful. Hang on. <laughs> do I dare? Of course I do. You know I have one in my pocket, yeah. right? I mean, and it's a C cell, by the oh way. Oh, nice. Yes, thank you. <laughs> But I tell you, I don't use the vape as much as I used to. Mm -hmm. It was an easy um, way to consume the medicine. Mm -hmm. um, when maybe perhaps at times that I didn't necessarily need it for pain relief, mm -hmm. but I just wanted to get the edge off of my life. Now that the vaping ban is in effect, I have pretty, I, obviously I can't get it at my medical dispensary anymore, which is upsetting to me because none of the cases in Massachusetts, as far as we know, have anything to do with this market. This mm -hmm. And I know scientists, and I know the people that are putting the stuff in the cartridges, so I have faith in this system. Yeah. The governor does not. Yes. How upsetting is that for you? Well, I th I'm concerned about the cause, and the causes, it, but we're dealing with a technology and content that ha people have been consuming now for a decade plus. We have millions of people who have taken billions of hits off of vape pens, and nobody suffered this, this sort of sudden onset of lung disease followed by death until about two years ago. So that tells me it's not the content. It's most likely the, the material. There's something about the cartridge. Well, where are they obtaining their cartridges from? My bet is they're obtaining them from China, which right. is the cheapest place to manufacture things. Right. Having people I know in the construction industry, they tell me that when, chi when production is moved to China, products that they've used for years and years, they inevitably get modified. They change the production process, and quality ends up declining somehow. And either the lock on the laminate floor doesn't lock the same way anymore, or the, uh, the bricks are different sizes. Uh, it's just things that are often a little bit odd. So I wouldn't be surprised in the least if they used a dangerous heavy metal in the construction of the cart because they could save some money that way. Yeah. And when I talked to a supply company out of South Portland, Maine at NECAN a couple weeks ago, one of these suppliers said, look, these cartridges, I can get them for 88 cents or I can get them for $3.25. That's a big difference and a big profit margin uh, when you were in business looking at the, the manufacture of these things, absolutely, right? Absolutely, absolutely. There's such a money grab, though, going on in this industry right now, and people aren't thinking in, wait, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean? It's, it's the same as every industry. I mean, it's... It when there's an opportunity in a capitalist society, free society, go for it, right? When, when, when the tech bubble started, I mean, what, what is a bubble if not a whole bunch of people throwing a whole bunch of chasing a whole bunch of money and then shaking out? You know, so yeah, this is what happens. And we know uh, in, in Colorado when dispensaries or rec stores opened, they were all over the place and then there's been a contraction. Um, that's not surprising at all. Same thing's gonna happen in Massachusetts, although the CCC is trying to prevent that somehow by making sure that people who are going into this business have enough capital behind them. 
but that isn't itself going to be a, a constraint on this. I mean, you're going to see instead of it being mom and pop stores competing with each other, it'll be larger scale uh, Rev Clinics and Sierra door to door next to each other, and each one of them trying to, you know, hit the bottom. But it's race to the bottom. It's uh, one dollar, one dollar grams, and and twenty eight, twenty eight dollar ounces, like in Washington. That's the American way, like in Washington D.C. Oh, in oh, Washington State, I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry, Unc Uncle Ike's in Seattle o offers $28 ounces. Oh my, oh, my God. I mean, I remember $20 ounces, yeah. just for the record. It's not, it's not the most trimmed. It's not, the, it's, you know, it's B and C quality flour, yeah. but it's $28. Right. I, okay, look, you know, you know, one hit, two hits, three hit weed, or is it I got to smoke the whole joint to get high, right? I mean, that's the mentality. Um, let's talk about Washington D.C. I let that. I want to talk about what's going on down there. Um, Aaron Smith and the NCIA, the Trade Association, the lobby group are doing an amazing job. I've lived to see the day in the House of Representatives where a positive cannabis law actually got voted in over a two-thirds majority. Mm -hmm. The Safe Banking Act has passed the House. It's in the Senate. It's now in the hands of Mitch McConnell and the guys. And by the way. Mitch McConnell deserves this because he's the one who opened up this Pandora's box with the farm bill by making CBD and hemp. He didn't think this was going to happen. He had to know that this might happen. I'm not sure he even knows what CBD is. There you go. I was waiting for that one, too. Uh, he did have lunch with the cannabis industry in California recently, right? Um, so let's talk about um, federal. Um, Steve D'Angelo, who I'm sure you know uh, from California, um, told me that the president any president, let's not talk about the specifics here, mm -hmm. any president can pick up the phone, call the DOJ, and get cannabis descheduled without anything else. Yes, that's correct. Do you think he's going to use it politically to get reelected? How's that? No. Good. Tell me why. I don't think it will buy him anything. Um, at this it, point? Well, it, it, at the current, the current situation that we're in, you're not going to get that many votes by being uh, there aren't that many single issue cannabis voters in the United States. Right. There are some of them. I, I have been one myself yeah. where I have said I'm not voting for this candidate because this candidate wants to put me in jail. Right. OK, but if somebody says, oh, I'm going to legalize marijuana at the federal level and then there's a, two other people say I'm going to do the same thing. Well, I mean, and then further than that, the, the president has a problem with the truth. No, he I thought it was the media's <laughs> fault. <laughs> what he says on Monday, he contradicts on Tuesday, and then re-contradicts on Wednesday. For a deal maker, he bargains against himself more than anybody I've ever seen. How old are you, Keith? Uh, 51. Okay, so you're 11 years younger than me, so I did grow up in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the 60s, I grew up, and the greatest leaders of my time got shot and killed. Mm -hmm. Martin Luther King, Bobby Kennedy, and JFK. I don't get it. With all the guns and all the assault rifles that are out there, I, and then all the people that he's pissed off in his tenure, no one's ever done anything or even thought about doing anything like that. Not that I'm telling you to go do that. What's your feeling about that? My feeling when he claimed that he was being lynched, oh, that was um, it, where he plays that he's always the victim, yeah. what he seems to forget is that <laughs> other presidents have had it much harder, such as JFK, in that he got killed right. instead of just metaphorically given a hard time. Right, exactly. And that, you know, it's been a fascinating time, but it's also the only time in my life I've really said I'm embarrassed to be an American. It's, yeah, it has been rough. Um, and it's not, it's uh, not because he's uh, politically, he and I disagree because we've had presidents and politicians that I disagree with. But the thing is, is that they are able to operate as a politician. They lie to me. I know that they're lying to me. That's okay. We'll figure, you know, because in your lie, there is a truth. There's something in there that you are telling me, even when you're saying what I want to hear, and I know that you're not really behind it. My mother used to say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. Indeed. And they're experts at that. Yes, absolutely. Do they go to school for that, or are they just born that way? I think it's just, yeah, it's a talent. It really is. Keith, you've been great to talk to. I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this little appearance on In the Weeds with Jimmy. Yeah. Always do. Yeah, right. this is great. great. Great to meet you. Great to talk with you. He's Keith Saunders from Normal, the board of directors here in Massachusetts. The cannabis community is in good hands. I can tell you that because I know some of your comrades. And remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there, folks. Use it responsibly. We are pro-cannabis media.